Maxwell not only unified electricity and magnetism, he also showed that light is electromagnetism. But what is light exactly? While thankfully few of us have ever been hit by lightning, we've at least seen it splashed across the sky. Combined with our experiences with static cling, magnets, and light, which are representative phenomena of electromagnetism, we all have at least get a basic feel for the knowledge embodied in Maxwell's equations. Although we all have personal experience with electromagnetism, our experiences are actually pretty limited. That's because our senses have a fairly limited scope. We're concerned with objects from, oh, the size of a grain of sand to the journey to the next meal or watering hole, say, a millimeter to tens or hundreds of kilometers. We have a personal familiarity with temperatures ranging from a polar vortex to a roaring campfire, say temperatures from as low as minus 30 Celsius to maybe 1,000 degrees Celsius. However, there are places in the universe that are much different, with conditions that are unimaginable to us. There's the tiny realm of the atom in the grand sweep of the Milky Way, with temperatures ranging from so cold that air turns into a liquid to so hot that they can tear apart a star. It was with the opening days of the 20th century that scientists began to take their first tentative steps into a vast and new world to learn about how matter behaved under conditions that had never been before investigated. It is therefore not at all shocking that surprises arose. In fact, that's an important lesson to keep in your mind. The lesson being that as soon as you step outside of your comfort zone, you should expect to be surprised. As we move ahead in our journey of trying to imagine a theory of everything, that should be your mantra. Expect the unexpected. I'll let the story tell itself, but the core idea of this lesson is an understanding of light that unifies the idea of a particle and the idea of a wave. One of the oldest arguments in physics is on the nature of light. Is light a particle or a wave? You'd think that'd be easy to determine. After all, waves and particles are pretty different things. Waves have wavelengths, frequencies, and amplitudes, and extend over a large volume. In contrast, particles have a well-defined location without the trappings of a wave. They're very different beasts, and it seems that figuring out which of the two that light is would be an easy task. Maxwell confirmed that light is a wave, but we'll see that a fully correct answer is a lot harder than it seems. Suppose a person proposed one or the other. At a minimum, their proposal needed to explain some of the things we see light do. For example, we know that light can reflect. That's easy to demonstrate using a simple mirror. We also know that light refracts, which is the effect whereby light bends when it passes from air to a transparent solid. While early discussions began in Greek antiquity, the arguments were essentially philosophical until around the time of Newton. Newton was a proponent of the particle view. If light is a particle, it's easy to explain how light reflects. It's no different than bouncing a tennis ball off the ground. If you assume that light travels faster through a solid than it does through air, the particle idea can explain the observed bending of light as well. We now know that this assumption is exactly backwards. Light travels more slowly through solid matter than it does air, but that wasn't known at the time. It was Newton's extraordinary scientific reputation that led to the particle theory of light to be favored for a very long time. However, the wave idea had its adherents. English scientist Robert Hooke and Dutch mathematician Christian Huygen, both rough contemporaries of Newton, worked out a wave theory of light. This theory can also explain reflection and refraction, although the refraction explanation required that light move more slowly in solid matter rather than gaseous matter. We now know that this is correct. However, for about 150 years, there was no measurement to prove it. Of special note, Huygens postulated that there was a substance called the luminiferous ether, which allowed light to travel as a wave. While we no longer believe in the ether, theorists continue to talk about it into the late 19th century. The lack of any evidence for ether was an objection to the wave theory. The argument persisted until about 1800, when a series of experiments by English polymath Thomas Young demonstrated rather persuasively that light was actually a wave. Given the definitive nature of the experiment, it's worth spending a few minutes describing it. 
One of the properties of waves that is very different from particles is that they can interfere with one another. You can see this at the seashore when two waves cross one another, and the result is temporarily a single but larger wave. This is called constructive interference. Similarly, you can see when the peak of one water wave encounters the trough of another. The result is that the two waves cancel each other out, and this is called destructive interference. Young's experiment used an opaque barrier with two adjacent slits. When light illuminated a single slit, it passes through the slit and it spreads out. That's true of the other slit as well. Now, if light is a wave, you'd expect it to look like ripples in a pond that you see when you drop a stone in the water. On the other hand, both slits generate these ripples, which means that there would be two sources of waves. And as I said before, waves can interfere with one another. There would be spots that are peaks of one set of waves and troughs of another set of waves, which would cancel out. Canceling out light means there would be dark spots on a distant screen. Similarly, there would be places where the peaks of both sets of waves would appear at the same time and same location, resulting in bright spots on the distant screen. And that's exactly what we see. Bright spots and dark spots. Young's double-slit experiment is the definitive and inarguable demonstration that light is a wave. After this experiment, the discussion was over. Maxwell's equations of the 1860s and 1870s simply solidified the situation. So that was the status quo for quite a while. However, in 1887, German physicist Heinrich Hertz did an experiment that was most puzzling indeed. What he was doing was taking two electrodes and attaching them to both ends of a very strong battery. If he did so, occasionally a spark would jump between the electrodes. You might have seen a similar sort of thing if you've ever tried to jumpstart a car. So sparks were nothing new. But Hertz's real contribution was that he saw that if he illuminated the electrodes with ultraviolet light, the sparks occurred more easily than if the same experiment was done in the dark. So that was kind of cool. The initial explanation was that the electromagnetic field was knocking out some of the electrons from the electrodes, which then started a chain reaction. Actually, even now, that's what we think. But there's more. People started playing around with the parameters that define the light. Those are actually only two important things. The first is the color of the light. In wave terms, this was the wavelength. While the second important thing is the brightness. For a wave, that's the amplitude. So what did they see? Well, the first thing people saw was that the color of the light seemed to matter. If you used red light, you got no spark enhancement. This was also true for orange and yellow light. It was also true for green, blue, and purple. But when the light was ultraviolet, the sparks would form. By the way, just to be honest, I'm talking about electrodes made of a certain element. There are a few elements, such as the high mass alkali metals, like cesium, for example, that would spark when irradiated by visible light. But the basic pattern is unchanged. For all materials, certain colors, visible or not, will induce a spark, while others won't. So there are a couple of things to keep in mind. First is that whole Roy G. Biv thing, which are the colors of the rainbow. In order, they are red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Further, the color of light is determined by the wavelength, with the red being long wavelength and the violet being shorter. Or, if you prefer, you can use the fact that the wavelength and frequency of light is related by the mathematical relationship. Frequency times wavelength equals the speed of light. That means red light is low frequency, while purple light is high frequency. So this says that high frequency, or equivalently short wavelength light, can cause a spark, while low frequency and long wavelength light can't. So that's the first observation. The second observation is that if you shine low-frequency light on the electrode, you can crank the brightness higher and higher, and you get no spark. You could turn it up to the point where the brightness is overwhelming, and it still just wouldn't budge the sparkometer. So that's where things get tricky. Remember that Young's double-slit experiment established that light was a wave, and waves have certain properties. One of them is that the energy of the wave is dependent on the amplitude. Thus, if you cranked up the brightness, you should be hitting the electrode with more energy. Well, if light were a wave anyway. So, so much for the wave idea.